loud. Okay, I have four people in the waiting room, so give me a minute. Where are they? <laughs> oh, here we go. Admit. Okay. All right. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to our March Housing Task Force meeting. Thank you for being part of our time this evening. Um, I would ask that everyone mute their computers to avoid any background noises or feedback as we are recording this session. And we are honored to have a special guest with us tonight, thinking he was from Denver, but he's all the way out in Seattle, Washington, spending time with us this evening. I'm going to ask Kathy Smith to make introductions. But before we do that, um, Rocky has indicated he's interested in knowing where everyone is in the state of Colorado, what localities we're from. So I'll start out. I'm from Loveland. And let's. I'll just call you out. Kathy Smith. Golden. Ann Sutton. Oops, you're muted, Ann. Westminster. Thank you. Betty Sealand. And you're muted. I'm sorry, Betty. Lakewood. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have your first name up here. M. Rothermel. It's Maggie. Maggie. I'm in Estes Park. Estes Park. Okay. okay. Sherry Templeton. Um, I'm on the Western Slope, Gunnison, Colorado. Jill Armstrong. Hi, unincorporated Jefferson County. Vaughn Zednick. Oops, you're muted, Vaughn. Oops. Oh, we're not hearing you, but I know Vaughn. She's from Loveland. All right. <laughs> Susan Gibson. Uh, unincorporated Boulder County. All right. Kate. Lakewood. Joe. Uh, Arvada. Joe Federer. Um, unincorporated Douglas County. Cindy Sestrick. Denver. Rona Shore. Denver. Deb Armbruster. Apaho. Kathleen. Golden. Mindy Moore. Arvada. Beth Hendricks. Denver. Roberta. Bolden. Tony. Denver. And Joseph, I'll call at you again. I'm sorry. Uh, Arvada. Arvada. All right. Thank you. All right. That's great. So that gives you an idea, Rocky. Um, I think we're covering quite a bit of the territory. Yeah. So a lot of Metro folks, uh, folks from North Front Range, West Slope. So uh, uh, delight to be with you all tonight. All right. So Kathy, I'll turn it over to you to introduce our speaker. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, we've had the pleasure of interacting a lot with Rocky uh, with the state legislation last year and this year uh, with all the land use planning um, bills. So um, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Rocky Pirro. Dr. Pirro is a recently retired urban planner, author, and professor. He earned his doctorate in urban design and planning from the University of Washington. Rocky served as director of the Colorado Center for Sustainable Urbanism at the University of Colorado, Denver, and also worked as associate research professor at CU's College of Architecture and Planning. Previously, Rocky was the manager for planning and community development for the city of Denver. 
He is active in several national and international organizations, including the American Planning Association, and he was inducted into the American Institute of Certified Planners College of Fellows in 2010. His areas of interest include smart growth, sustainability, healthy communities, collaborative planning, and community engagement. He is a frequenter, frequent presenter at local, national, and international events, and we are very fortunate to have him speaking to us this evening about Colorado's attempts to adopt growth strategies legislation the past 50 years. So take it away, Rocky. All right, thank you much. Let me uh, get my screen up and running here. So we'll go. So, uh, so, so thank you so much. I mean, the um, uh, just hit the wrong button here. So let me go back. Uh, there we go. All right. Yeah, the league has been dear uh, to my heart. I mean, um, before I even uh, started college or graduate school, I uh, was really enamored with uh, urban planning, community development, and um, the league would sponsor these fantastic uh, events to tour historic areas of Denver. So I grew up in, in Denver, uh, up in, in North Denver. I did my um, master's work at the University of Colorado, as, as Kathy mentioned, and uh, have always just kind of had a, a love affair for for uh, Denver and and Colorado, so uh, I uh, have enjoyed the the work of the league. I mentioned uh, to Trisha uh, before we got started uh, when I was working as a uh, playing director in Denver. I really appreciated the work that the League of Women Voters was doing on the state's proposal to do uh, a mega expansion of I-70 through the Global Illyria and Swansea neighborhoods. And I have to say of all the information and different studies uh, that were done, the work of the league was by far uh, some of the most accurate, the most detailed, uh, the most thoughtful, and um, wasn't necessarily given the attention that it should have been, but I think it's played out over the last 10 years, uh, just how spot on uh, the league was with uh, its analysis and uh, and uh, concerns about potential uh, impact. So I actually joined the league uh, uh, back at that point in time to support and uh, to, to be able to interact. So tonight, as uh, we mentioned, uh, we're gonna look a little bit about at Colorado's uh, unique planning history that has a lot of bearing on your group uh, you know, with your interests in, in housing and some of the housing legislation that's been in play uh, last session and uh, during the current session. So I call this presentation already, not yet. So things we've been able to get done in Colorado, but things that uh, we still uh, need to uh, give some attention to and lift up here. So I'm gonna start with just a real quick blitz of a walkthrough of um, where we have been. So um, planning is only about 100 years old in the United States. So it started in the 1920s. So this is the decade where we're celebrating the centennial of uh, urban planning uh, becoming uh, a mainstay of uh, how communities uh, uh, put together plans and strategies uh, for, for their future um, and in the 70s, there was a little bit of a revolution to try to um, update and evolve planning statutes that by that point in time were about 50 years old. Colorado was really a leader at that time, along with three other states of so Vermont, uh, Oregon, and Hawaii, to pass really meaningful uh, land use legislation to give more form and direction to what uh, municipalities, uh, counties, and uh, the state should be doing to plan for growth. Uh, it then repealed the legislation about uh, four years later. It's the only state to have ever done that. So uh, we're gonna walk through quickly some of our attempts to kind of get back into the game here uh, since then. But it's important to note that many states built on what Colorado tried to do in the 70s 
uh, and have put together some just amazing and very detailed and sophisticated approaches for, for guiding growth while we continue to try to figure out things here. So in the 80s, uh, we, uh, try, we tried again to um, put um, statutory requirements back in place. This was driven by my professional association. Uh, we were not successful. Governor Romer in the 90s came up with this notion of voluntary growth management. He created an awards program with it. Uh, we had things such as in the metro area, the Mile High Compact, where jurisdictions just agreed they were all going to try to do their own sorts of um, growth strategies here. That kind of ran its course uh, with uh, uh, for about a decade and then just um, was ignored. I mean, one of the key drivers back in the 90s was look at, looking at the metro area, and I know a lot of you are, are, are uh, from the Denver region, that at that point in time, we were looking at um, uh, well over 700 square miles uh, of uh, land within the metro area was already urbanized. And if we didn't do anything significant, we'd be up to 1,100 square miles by the year 2020. So that was one of the catalysts for doing voluntary uh, growth agreements and so on. Where we are at in 2020 is 1,100 square miles. So all of those good efforts and try to do this uh, more advisory and voluntarily uh, in the end uh, were not successful. So there was an effort then uh, in the early 2000s to try to do this through uh, an amendment and then again through some state legislation. Only one piece of that passed, and I'll talk about that here in a, in a second. Uh, again, there were efforts um, that went into uh, more the more recent decade here. We tried three different times to make water something that local jurisdictions would have to address in their uh, comprehensive plans. And it only passed in 2020 when it was made optional, that jurisdictions can choose to plan for water if they want or not. And then uh, you're familiar with uh, what happened last year and uh, that we had some very ambitious things develop. So the um, Senate Bill 213 uh, took on a variety of housing issues and grew into a very robust uh, growth management bill. Uh, but there were a lot of moving pieces and parts to that. And in the end, you know, we were not successful. So this year, a lot of what was in that legislation has been broken up into uh, bite-sized bits here. And uh, we'll see where that's taking us. Uh, I'll just make a, a first comment right now that the stuff around comprehensive planning that we worked on last year is pretty well absent this year. So uh, that's one thing that just has kind of fallen by the wayside here. So here's just a map of the country and uh, you can see Colorado there with the little uh, asterisk is uh, the only state that's uh, adopted uh, growth and environmental legislation and, and then repealed it. And uh, I won't go into all the different color coding, but uh, you know the different states shown in blue and green and so on are, are states since the 70s that have really developed much more sophisticated uh, frameworks for guiding a uh, comprehensive plan around environmental issues as well as growth management. So you see a lot of the country is still gray and unfortunately, you know, Colorado took a step backwards and uh, is a kind of part of that club that uh, uh, is a, a lot more uh, laissez-faire and um, and uh, business as, as usual with uh, addressing how we uh, attack land use uh, challenges and issues. So it's just some quick bullets uh, that summarize this. So again, we've got like 28 states now uh, that have uh, different sorts of programs in place to address environmental systems, uh, critical areas, uh, sensitive lands, uh, ways to guide growth. Many states have like growth boundaries to focus growth in areas that already have access to facilities and services. 
and again, uh, that last bullet, uh, Colorado has just kind of uh, joined the bottom half uh, uh, of the states in, in, in terms of doing anything meaningful. So here's just kind of a quick overview of where Colorado is today. So what you have on the right is actually work that the State Department of Local Affairs does to encourage good planning in Colorado. So they have a wealth of really good resources on how you can address each of these uh, different issues at the local level. But this is all advisory only. I mean, you can opt to address these issues as a local government if you want to. The only one that's required, curiously enough, is that top one, recreation and tourism. So that's kind of a, a, a almost amusing uh, residue thing from the efforts in the late 90s and 2000s to reestablish uh, meaningful comprehensive planning. So that did get passed. Uh, uh, but then when there was um, uh, subsequent legislative action to adopt the entire package, it just fell short uh, by a, a few votes. So in reality, local jurisdictions are supposed to address recreation and tourism. Everything else is optional. But I mean, whether recreation and tourism is even addressed is, is, uh, is a question mark here. So the bullets on the left just kind of point out some of uh, the key things we're dealing with uh, today. I mean, we're still working with very antiquated frameworks for land use and, and planning and the related issues of environment, housing, transportation. A lot of what we do is just very in incremental and piecemeal. Our planning doesn't have to line up with zoning. So you have a curiosity. When I worked with Denver, we actually had two zoning codes in play, and uh, they didn't necessarily line up with uh, the city's comprehensive plan. There's no guidance from the state on how often to update the plan or how to deal with amendments and so on. Again, with Denver, uh, Denver went for 20 years without updating uh, its comprehensive plan. I mean, during those decades, you know, it, it, it became very uh, irrelevant and, uh, and uh, not uh, a major factor. Colorado has huge challenges. So um, I'm using some information from some a couple of symposiums that we held at the University of, of Colorado. Well, actually on the Auraria campus, we partnered with Metro State and with um, the community college as well here and a lot of different partners. And, you know, this is beginning to make the case that just addressing stuff incrementally and optionally is not helping Colorado in the 21st century. So, I mean, if you look at these issues, and these issues are all interconnected, you know, as we look at housing, we have to ensure that there's adequate infrastructure, that there's ad adequate water. Uh, there's a lot of... Uh, review of the current legislation that's being proposed around housing, whether it does enough around issues of equity and ensuring that the people uh, in our communities that are most in need of affordable housing have that opportunity. Uh, are we looking at potentially developing housing in areas that have hazards, contamination, pollution? I mean, these issues all interrelate. And um, uh, there's, work that has gone into putting together this information. I just tried to summarize it on one slide here, but you know, if you just go around and look at, at these issues, we have water challenges. I mean, we have housing challenges with a housing shortage, 9,000 homeless people on an average per night across the state of Colorado. Uh, we rank poorly in terms of poverty, the amount of land that gets converted uh, from resource and rural lands, from agricultural and forest lands to urbanization uh, is alarming. And it contributes to um, us having one of the worst rating of home loss to wildfires. So we have probably less than 10% of the amount of acres lost to forest fires every year as the state of California. Um, yet uh, we rank among the worst because of where we've allowed uh, housing developments uh, to occur. 
you know, look at what we're dealing with with uh, contaminated uh, sites across the state. And again, uh, a very questionable record in terms of uh, maintaining our infrastructure. So this kind of incremental approach that we use in Colorado, uh, what you see in this diagram is kind of the state of planning right now. When I worked with the city of Denver, we identified we probably had some 60 plans, discrete plans on this topic and this issue and uh, this, this concern, this theme or, or whatever. Uh, Colorado Springs, I've interacted with uh, some of the planners there they have some 40 different plans uh, that, um, that address different uh, topics and themes. And I mean, as a planner, I, I'm kind of embarrassed to say this results in kind of a death by planning here that uh, uh, a lot of these plans have great uh, components and, and content and strategies, um, but um, they're not used in a way that really makes it user friendly for, for citizens, for the communities to participate. It, it's not easy for elected officials, it's not easy for staff, definitely not easy for developers or people who want to uh, uh, invest in a community. So what I'm offering here is uh, this alternative you see on the right that that we create, you know, more of an integrated framework. All those issues that I showed that you can address, you may address in Colorado one by one, fit into this system of systems here uh, that uh, if we just restructured and created a new framework for our planning based on natural systems, built environment systems, economic and social systems, we cover everything and it's interdisciplinary and it's, it's taking into account the issues as they relate to each other. So this is just a follow-up. Can we move from uh, our current uh, very modest framework that we have on the left to something that's uh, more integrated and brings these uh, key issues together? So that is the outcome of a couple of uh, major events that have happened. One in May of 2019, we had to take a break during the um, pandemic. We reconvened in June 2022. Uh, a lot of different players and organizations here. I know there's a lot of alphabet stuff up there uh, just to get stuff to uh, fit on the slide, but this includes civil engineers, planners, public works officials, um, uh, sustainable infrastructure interests. As we went to our second symposium to work on this, we involved uh, Green Lat Latinos, Culta Vondo, Conservation Colorado, the Denver Neighborhood Association, um, the Colorado Healthy Places uh, Collaborative. We had more than 20 groups uh, involved. Both of these were sellout uh, events uh, and came up with some draft legislation that I kind of just teased about uh, a little bit uh, that we've been uh, introducing to legislators and um, have been using as, as a framework uh, to react to uh, legislative proposals that, that came together last year and again this year. So again, this is just another way of showing those same kind of seven main uh, systems here but again, you can see everything gets addressed. We address, you know, the whole range of facilities and infrastructure, utilities, as well as air issues, water issues, contamination, climate concerns, um, and, and so on. It creates, you know, a nice, neat framework and recognizes these interrelationships. So I just want to go through what's in e each of those um, different uh, systems right now. So in natural systems, you know, we need to look at protecting our critical areas and resource land. Again, this is done in some parts of Colorado, uh, but again, it's, it's rather lumpy. And the legislation last year lifted up agriculture, trying to protect agriculture lands, uh, but it is leading, leaving out some, some of these other critical types of land. Uh, we need to address contamination and Superfund cleanup. I mean, that's an issue with some of the legislation that's being proposed right now to increase housing around uh, 
station areas around transit stations. I mean, some of the areas where we have transit stations right now have some serious pollution issues. And, you know, those need to be addressed, uh, I think, if we're going to look at starting to increase uh, residences and employment and services in those locations. And then again, I've already talked a little bit about water, air, and so on. So again, I mean, this this is a systems approach to dealing with uh, natural environment issues here. Similarly with the built environment. So uh, we sometimes see our practices in Colorado blurry that we uh, allow for urban subdivisions and resource areas. So areas that are used mainly for forestry or agriculture uh, or so on. Rural areas should really be appreciated for their unique character, their unique economic purpose, their unique uses. They're not just holding areas for eventual urban, uh, urban development. Our urban areas, we should be intentional about what we're doing. Uh, as we talk about density, I cringe sometimes when we just talk about upzoning in existing communities and neighborhoods without really being sensitive to the fact that these existing places have character. There's community character. There's a rhythm to the design in these places. And new investments you need to be respectful for that. This, this final bullet here, buildable lands analysis. Now we've made some traction last year and this year again with having that brought into the legislation. This has been huge. So cities, states across the US that have tried to analyze where do they have vacant land, partially vacant land, underutilized land. It's been a game changer for them to see that they have a wealth of opportunity to invest in infill and redevelopment in existing urban areas without having to annex new lands or to continue to sprawl into um, rural areas here. So if we can accomplish that, I think in Colorado, the, that would be huge. Again, just some more points about um, what we would address uh, in the area of built environments, also with mobility, you know, we're, we're talking a lot and I know your group is interested in housing for all, similarly with transportation, you know, how do we ensure that we have mobility for, for all? It's estimated that about a third of the population in the United States doesn't drive cars. Uh, and, you know, what are we doing to ensure that everyone has accessibility and mobility to the places they, they, they need to go, go to here? Similarly with facilities, I know we're working right now in some of the legislation on water adequacy, but it's really important that we also consider the adequacy of our stormwater systems, our wastewater systems, public safety, our fire uh, protection systems, ensure that our schools don't get in, uh, overcrowded as, as we densify and so on. And again, many other parts of the country have gone to like reassessment strategies that before they allow new development, they look to make sure services are adequate. And if they're not, they go through a process to try to identify what needs to happen to bring the services uh, up to an acceptable uh, level so that we're not um, stressing out uh, facilities and uh, creating scarcities or gaps in service de delivery here. Housing, uh, a lot of this has come out of great work of you and uh, other housing advocate groups right now that we really need to look at housing uh, in, um, in uh, all of its uh, different forms here. So the housing gap uh, analysis is critical uh, to understand, you know, where do we have demands and our products are, are not uh, serving that need here. Um, there needs to be a variety of housing types. And again, homelessness worries me a little bit that uh, we're not addressing that nearly as much as we could be with, with some of the different legislation. Uh, economic systems, I won't spend a lot of time on this this, this evening, but again, moving towards uh, economic opportunities that reflect 
our access to the resources we already have in our regions uh, in Colorado and ensure that our, our practices uh, around economic development uh, are, are sustainable. And then finally, uh, talk about social systems and, and then health um, in the next slide, that it's critically important as we look at housing, as we look at service provision, as we look at mobility, all of these issues to ensure that we're not continuing to create a system of those who have and those who have not. So to ensure that everyone has access to decent housing, uh, a clean environment, uh, living wage jobs, uh, and, and the like here. And that we look at health issues in all of these as well. I mean, transportation systems have health implications. They have safety implications. Uh, how we build our homes, the materials we use, again, uh, health issues uh, with regard to that. Having a healthy environment translates into uh, healthy uh, humans. So uh, again, these issues are all uh, interrelated. So this is just a quick overview of what's in this draft act that I talked about. Again, we're just kind of using it as a template last year and this year as we look at different bills that are drafted and offering things that could be brought into this. There is interest with some legislators this year to look at spending some time between now and the 2025 session to see if we can't put together uh, some legislation that really advances a more integrated interdisciplinary uh, approach to how we address comprehensive planning in Colorado. Uh, a key issue is that whatever we do, there needs to be consistency and coordination. And it's lumpy right now with some of the bills in, um, in, in play in the legislation. Uh, there's gonna be a need to reconcile. Some bills are advancing principles that uh, need to be addressed in other bills if, if they're gonna be uh, successful. And uh, that kind of translation and, um, and, um, and integration uh, has, has not yet happened. Happen. So again, this is just kind of my final slide and uh, welcome anyone getting in touch with me. So uh, there's my contact information. Kathy has it, Trish has it. So uh, if anyone wants to follow up, I know I, I went through this uh, pretty quickly here. Uh, ha happy um, to talk about that. I'm going to stop sharing my screen, but if someone wants to, uh, has a question about a certain image or something, I, I can pop that back up on this screen. So I think we can go to just some Q&A right now, Trish. Rocky, will you uh, be willing to share your slides with us that we can post on the website? Yeah, definitely. So I'll send those along so, so you guys have access to those, you bet. Thanks so much. So I see Cindy has a hand up. Hi, Cindy. Hi, Rocky. Um, since I've been involved with Denver planning, from a citizen standpoint, um, it really depends on who the mayor is with a lot of this. But what role does Dr. Cog play anymore? Is there any strength there? I mean, they were trying to stop the urban sprawl. What's happened? Yeah, so um, I've done a lot of work with regional planning organizations across the country. And um, I actually served when I was planning director in Denver uh, the mayor named me to be his uh, rep uh, at Dr. Cog. So mm -hmm. uh, I got to know that process and got to know a lot of the uh, uh, elected at, at that point in time. Um, there really isn't a lot of guidance in state legislation for what Dr. Cog could be doing or should be doing. So right. there's certain base expectations that it does as a metropolitan planning organization. So that's a federal designation. Mm -hmm. So the US government requires that urban regions have metropolitan planning for transportation. Uh, and they want to make sure that that planning is coordinated among member jurisdictions in, in a region uh, for the region to be eligible to receive federal dollars. So, so Dr. Cog uh, performs that function and does that, I think, uh, 
uh, uh, very well. Uh, other functions it does, uh, they just leave it to the membership of the organization to give them uh, guidance for what the agenda should be. So for example, some of you may know that Dr. Cog has a program for senior services. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I mean, that's very unique in the US. I mean, very few other regional councils do that. But on the other hand, in terms of relating what the regional plan has with local plans, um, there really isn't any structure for that. So Dr. Cog does produce plans on a regular basis, but there isn't anything in state law that requires local governments to really address the regional plan and follow any of those provisions. So that's a big disconnect. Now, some places do a great job. Aurora just updated its comp plan in 2019 and makes a lot of reference to its role within the region and the regional plan. Uh, but that's not across the board. Uh, Trish mentioned that I'm out in Seattle right now. Uh, very much different here. So state law does say that the region has to develop certain planning pro uh, policies on a number of issues and local jurisdictions must address the regional plan in order for them to be eligible to receive federal funding. So uh, we have a much more coordinated system in Seattle where uh, when the regional plan is updated, for example, it was updated about 10 years ago to address climate and design and health. With that being folded into the regional plan, then it becomes mandatory that the local jurisdictions also address those issues in their local plan. So, so Dr. Cog is um, uh, a little weaker uh, than many, many other reg regional bodies. So, uh, so in the Seattle area, was that initiated by the legislature? Uh, what was that, Cindy? Was the planning in the Seattle area in a centralized yeah. form? Was right. that initiated by the legislature? So interestingly, yes. So up until 1990, the Seattle uh, version of Dr. Cog was was very much like the Denver example. So it was kind of a voluntary association. Local jurisdictions did not have to address the regional plan. So in 1990, the state stepped in and said the regional planning has a value and purpose uh, for ensuring consistency and to address issues which transcend local boundaries. And so the regional plan now has standing and status and has to be recognized locally. And it's, um, yeah, there's tie-ins. So if a local jurisdiction opts not to do it, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, they don't take the elected officials to jail in handcuffs, but uh, <laughs> the local jurisdiction then loses its ability to compete for federal dollars that the region manages. Mm -hmm. So, Great. thank okay. you. Tony. Um, I worked on, a an initiative, you know, I think it was in the early 80s, to actually give Dr. Cog more power. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, it was sponsored by the League of Women Voters. Um, and um, unfortunately, it ran into some roadblocks, one being Douglas County that sued us for doing it. And then we just sort of lost momentum totally. Right. But I, I was working on land issues and water issues in the 70s. And it, it's kind of hard to keep going and being um, enthusiastic and optimistic about having something change. Is there anything different, anything we could play on, pull out that would make it different now in the, in the um, 2000s? I think we're seeing some opportunities. I mean, I was pleasantly surprised last year, Tony, to see how, you know, the governor's interest in ad addressing the housing crisis in the state all of a sudden started to morph into addressing land use issues and then water issues and ended up having regional components uh, folded into that. I mean, it, it was fascinating to see how that evolved. So made me scratch my head a little bit and think, you know, maybe 
the planets are uh, aligning again right now that that there may be some opportunities looking at this year's legislation so um i've talked with with kathy to some degree about some of the different bills but the the parking uh the revisiting of, of parking requirements uh, that piece of legislation has a regional component in it it's basically saying if we're going to look at um how to better manage parking when we're trying to do affordable housing that needs to happen on a regional basis so that law is act actually has a, a regional element in it. Now, one of the other bills uh, that um, is in play is this uh, housing needs assessment by uh, Senators Kirkmeyer and Zenzinger. And it's addressing the need for localities to do housing needs assessment and the state, but is saying it's optional for, re for the region. And my personal opinion is, I mean, that that needs to be revisited. I think the region is the key entity there. The housing market is regional. Having localities, uh, you know, in, in the Denver region or the Fort Collins region or Colorado Springs region, where we've got multiple entities and everyone's kind of trying to do their own housing needs assessment without kind of a, a, a common game, game plan or, or framework. Uh, is, is going to be very frustrating. So I think having that done regionally is is probably a key thing that we need to encourage those senators to uh, bring into to their draft legislation. So if you were to recommend how we would develop enough people to support this package, everything coming together, if you will, uh, who would be there? Who would be at the table? And just as a footnote, I noticed the league wasn't at the table for that conference. Yeah, I wish we could have uh, had you engaged. And uh, uh, I, I think we reached out a little bit, but maybe not to the right people. So uh, apologies there, because uh, you, you, you guys would have just added value. There's no question. Yeah, I think you're on top of it. I mean, there are so many groups right now that are... Uh, involved in housing, housing advocacy, issues around equity, environmental justice. I mean, us, all sorts of groups, once again, looking at, can we resurrect growth management in this state? And um, it's interesting, because again, I'm, I'm talking about the fact that this really does need to be coordinated, uh, I think, for, for it to be successful. And it's like there's all many there's almost too many players right now to be uh, uh, figuring out, you know, how to coordinate it and who needs to be at the table and, and who doesn't. At the second symposium we had, I think we reached out to like some 50 different organizations and had about 20 of them show up. I mean, I think all 50 of them have a, a voice in in uh, what we need to be doing go, going forward here. So. So definitely, I, I believe that I'm a strong proponent of engagement, engagement, engagement. I know a lot of um, elected officials and sometimes local staff are kind of allergic to public participation. They think that just bogs things down. My experience has been just the opposite. You know, the more people that you have involved, uh, the richer the outcome is and you have the buy-in then to be successful when you go forward with implementation you know even if you end up with almost the same thing that might have been done by a group of smart people in a back room you know uh there's always that suspicion and lack of trust by not having been engaged so uh so i know i'm not totally answering maybe, maybe we can work a little bit and, and try to sketch out a little uh, who should be at at at, at the table um, uh, li listing here uh, as as we look at opportunities for going forward? Okay. Trish. So, Rocky, you mentioned a few states on that that graphic. Um, yes. Of the the map of the U.S. that had really good integrated approaches. So what what tipped them or what pushed them in that direction and how how did they get there what 
you know, I, I guess I'm wondering if we're, we're struggling and we're so siloed mm -hmm. and it, you know, these journeys are a long time in the making. Yeah. Let me, I'm going to bring that map up. Uh, let's see if I can find it here. So there, there we got it. So let me scroll. Oops. It just went away. Okay. I'm going to bring, okay. Can you guys see it again? I'm going to get to that particular slide. There we go. Oops. Nope. <laughs> this, uh, wrong that direction. One. Okay, I'll go, I'll get there, I'll get there. So, silly screen. Okay, yeah, I mean, almost every state has its own story uh, here. So I'll just talk quickly, you know, uh, you mentioned I'm hanging out in, in Seattle. I split my time between Denver and Seattle. I, I got grandkids in Washington State, so... Uh, that's a draw. Uh, now that I've retired, I say that I'm a professional grandpa. So, uh, <laughs> so Oregon, as I mentioned, adopted growth management legislation at the same time Colorado did in the 70s. Washington was so allergic to doing anything that resembled what Oregon did. I mean, we often think of the Pacific Northwest and, you know, they're hand in hand. No. I mean, there was a lot of suspicion that at that time, Washington was saying, you know, we're kind of a libertarian state and, uh, you know, we kind of uh, respect local control and, you know, we're, we're not going to do anything uh, as, as uh, radical as Oregon. So when Washington State finally got into the game, where did they look? They looked at Georgia as a model for what to do in their system, because Oregon's process was a little bit more top down. You know, there were statewide goals. The state had a role for reviewing local plans to make sure they're consistent. Georgia did just the opposite. They said, here's what localities need to do. We're going to say, yes, you need to do uh, housing. You need to do land use. You need to do transportation. Uh, so you've got to do something. We're not going to tell you. We're not going to give you the state answer. You figure it out. The only uh, provision is you can't do nothing, okay? So, um, so Washington kind of liked that that approach. So uh, that's what happened there. You notice a lot of these are coastal states. Mm -hmm. so in many instances, uh, the issues driving them were uh, environmental issues uh, along uh, their coastlines. One reason California and North Carolina are in a little different shade of blue is that their growth management laws only apply to or only apply to coastal counties and not inland counties. Okay, Washington did something a little similar. So when Washington adopted its law, it said it's only going to apply to the large counties with big populations or fast-growing counties. So it only applied to 12 of the 39 counties when they adopted it. And they said the other counties could opt in. So we've talked a little bit, that might be a model for Colorado, rather than trying to come up with a one size fits all approach for all 64 counties in the state. What if we had one set of provisions for counties and municipalities along the I-25 corridor and the I-70 corridor, you know, and, uh, uh, maybe more modest sorts of requirements for uh, uh, localities in, in other parts of the state. So, yeah. So there there is just a whole slew of models out there. Minnesota had some environmental crises with um, its um, uh, water treatment. It's a stormwater and wastewater treatment systems. So that sort of galvanize that state legislature legislature to say we need something that makes sure we're being more efficient and more health conscious with what we're doing with facilities and uh and service in, in infrastructure so so yeah so so that's a, that's just a quick blitz mm -hmm. uh, uh trish i mean uh yeah so uh, each each state has uh, kind of its own uh, story Utah is kind of interesting because, you know, it's Colorado always likes to say it's, it's libertarian. I mean, I don't know that that term isn't used in all 50 states by somebody, you know, so uh, 
I know I mentioned that a lot when I hear from like the Colorado Municipal League about local control. Well, local control is important here. Well, there's 80,000 local governments across the United States. And I mean, they all believe in local control. So, but uh, again, I mean, there's places that have seen there's a need for some guidance, uh, but customize it and tailor it to your local situation and don't just do nothing uh, with that. So in Utah, they've come up with this very clever state framework. It's quasi official and quasi advisory, uh, but it was done very well with a lot of players. So they had uh, advocacy groups, they had the private sector involved, governmental interests were there, but not necessarily leading the process. And so it created this framework that uh, has become very popular uh, for jurisdictions to use in that state. So, okay, I'm gonna exit here because I can't see you all uh, <laughs> when, when I have that. Kathy. Yeah, can you um, talk a little bit about your thoughts about the transit oriented communities bill, House Bill yeah. 1313? Yeah, so 1313, and some of you may have uh, tracked, so that was in committee this last week, I think on, on Wednesday, a uh, very long committee meeting uh, with it. It did pass out a committee to continue uh, forward. Uh, so uh, that um, is uh, in a state of progress right now uh, with it. What this uh, bill does very crudely and, uh, and, and simply, is basically say areas where we have transit service and particularly where we have fixed service, uh, where we've got uh, uh, high capacity rail stations or corridors that uh, uh, use regular bus service, either local or regional bus service, that those should be places that we allow and welcome uh, density and to accommodate our future growth in employment projections. So, so it's that simple that uh, that should happen. Curiously, Dr. Cog came up with a concept like that about 10 years ago, that uh, much of our future growth should happen in station areas, uh, what they were calling at the time urban centers. But again, uh, they, they did not have um, any sort of uh, regulatory teeth uh, to make it happen. They, they basically just did modeling to show benefits of increasing densities at station areas. So that's what the, this bill would do in, in a nutshell. Now there's provisions in it for it to look at various housing needs and various housing products. I mean, one of the criticisms right now with development around station areas is that it looks pretty uh, cookie cutter, that uh, you end up with... Um, uh, multifamily, uh, uh, right now we've got kind of mid-rise uh, types of buildings, you know, three to five stories at a station area, and the units are pretty uh, homogenous. You know, they're two bedrooms, they're usually the same price point and so on. So this bill actually has incentives built in, so funding from the state that would help jurisdictions develop approaches to ensure that there's a greater mix of housing, that there's affordable housing, that there's housing for single households, that there's uh, housing for families in station areas that need multiple bedrooms and, and so on. So so those are some of the, the highlights uh, with that. And Kathy and I have uh, talked a little bit with the colleagues in uh, some other groups that we work with, such as Together Colorado, the American Planning Association, Green Latinos. There's a few things that would be great for you as a housing group to do a little deeper dive in uh, looking at. So one right now is the bill does talk about uh, displacement. So if an existing station area is going to take on new development, new investments, what happens to the existing residents there? Now, it uses the language of displacement, and it talks about, you know, ensuring that people continue 
to have a place to live somewhere. Uh, but I, a lot of us agree it really ought to talk about retention of people in their existing homes, as well as what to do if displacement occurs. So uh, there are, it seems with an emphasis just on displacement, it sounds a little bit about uh, like it's prioritizing gentrifying these places and that may price existing residents out and, and so on. I mean, there is a lot of work around the country where we're seeing uh, new investment in areas with existing residents where there are major efforts to try to keep people who already live there in the community. I mean, in Denver, we've tried to do that with the Sun Valley neighborhood. So I don't know if many of you have followed that process. So there were about 4,000 residents there 10 years ago. Um, well, over 80% of them are in uh, 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 public uh, assisted ha uh, uh, housing. Uh, a lot of uh, immigrant uh, people there. I mean, we went through a process of saying this is a neighborhood that needs reinvestment. It has a station area, but we're going to take steps to ensure that the people who live there now continue to live in the community as, as it redevelops. And so part of the strategy was that, you know, the existing housing was not in the best state of repair, that new housing would be built uh, with public dollars for existing residents uh, to uh, move into and still be in the neighborhood while other additional housing uh, is, is introduced. So, so that's a provision I think uh, we'd like to, to offer uh, uh, be incorporated in 1313. Sorry about my cuckoo clock back there. So, um, and um, then the other thing is uh, there's been some phenomenal work done by Green Latinos in concert with um, the University of Denver and CU Denver to look at where there are opportunities for affordable housing right now across the entire metro area. Uh, not necessarily just at stationaries, but just where is there vacant and partially vacant and underutilized lands? I mean, that buildable lands analysis. So Green Latinos has done that for us already. So, so they've identified this, but they've put some other lenses into play. So they have actually looked at the health conditions uh, in uh, many of these areas. And I know they've identified RTD fast track stations in Adams County, uh, at least one in Jefferson County, a couple in Denver, where there are concerns. We've got these uh, light rail stations or commuter rail stations open and operating right now, but there's contamination around them or there's polluting uh, activities nearby that impact them. So um, uh, there ought to be a mechanism in 1313 that we don't just blanketly say, say any place that has a station area is ripe for uh, um, densifying. Uh, if there's areas that have some health issues, you know, uh, those probably should be addressed first before we just say, uh, yeah, there's a train station there, uh, let's let's evolve that into a, a more compact uh, mixed use, higher density community. Okay, is that okay, Kathy? That's great, thank you very much. So Cindy has a question. I feel bad, Trish. I forgot to ask what your time frame is tonight. I don't know. I know we hit top of the hour. You're muted, Trish. Sorry about that. No, we're we're good, Rocky. If we're finished okay. up here, uh, we we could we could go till eight thirty, but we'll just see how many more questions we have. Uh, okay. And your yeah, timing as well. I'll stick around. I mean, if you have other business uh, that you need to do, I, I don't want to uh, no. sabotage that. Okay, so Cindy's got a question or comment. Yes, a um, couple of things here. Is the state looking at anything about the ratio of people to parks? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
And um, also, is there any municipality in Colorado that you think does a good job that you're familiar with, with this type of planning? Yeah, excellent question, Cindy. So I uh, try not to get on my soapbox, but one of the things I decided to take on when I retired was the park to people ratio issue. So, uh, so mm -hmm. it's almost like you were planted there for that. I'm going <laughs> to talk first about Denver. So, you know, we know over the last two decades, Denver's population has uh, increased significantly. So, I mean, it's almost 50% uh, more people than there was uh, at the turn of the century in, in the year 2000. So we went from about 500,000 up to 750,000. During the Webb administration, there was an intentionality to increase uh, parkland, uh, commensurate with our population growth. Uh, but he's been out of office for two decades. And uh, so we now have a situation where Denver now has a serious park deficit. And the city's own analysis shows that we're like 1900 acres shy of what we should have just to have the average amount of acreage that a typical American city has. So, I mean, just think of it. I mean, I grew up, maybe many of you did where, you know, Denver had this reputation. It's a city of parks, it's a city of neighborhoods. So we're losing uh, ground uh, on the park issue. So how are we going to get 1,900 additional acres uh, to just get back to average, you know, among all American cities? And given the projected growth rate that we have going into the next decade, into the 2030s and so on, it's closer to 3,800 acres uh, that we're going to need for, the, need for that. So again, this is from the city's own analysis. So the national average, just in case you're curious, is 13 acres per every thousand people. Denver right now is around nine acres per every thousand people. And again, there was a point in time when Den Denver uh, was very, uh, very generous uh, in, in, in those ratios. So yeah, uh, this is an issue that has to be addressed. I know once again, there've been kind of volunteer things. So um, there was an effort set up for the metro area about eight years ago called Metro DNA, which was looking at ways to increase parks and open space throughout uh, the um, seven county region. I don't think it was all nine counties uh, that are included in Dr. Cog. Uh, again, a lot of good science went into that, a lot of good research, got a lot of good information and data, but, uh, you know, where's the beat, you know, so there, there really wasn't any, weren't mechanisms for that particular group to actually uh, acquire uh, the properties needed. So right now we're in a situation where uh, it's up to local jurisdictions. So there is no guidance in state law that tells us to maintain parks, open space, other green infrastructure at a ratio that balances with, uh, with population numbers. So again, maybe that could be incorporated uh, if we were to, cr to create uh, this sustainability growth management framework for plans, as I mentioned, that that could be uh, a goal that, that the state um, asks local jurisdictions to work towards. But again, leave it to every local jurisdiction to figure out how they're gonna actually accomplish that. So does that help, Cindy? Okay. Uh, and also yeah. about the planning, is there any municipality that you know? Yeah, I was just gonna say that. Okay. You know, it, it comes and goes. So um, Golden, uh, for a while was doing some amazing stuff with planning, but again, uh, that was under, you know, particular mayor council leadership. So I would say some of the planning they had 10, 15 years ago was exemplary and worthy of, of national attention. Uh, I'm not sure they're still in that spot today. Fort Collins is probably always lifted up as the best example uh, that uh, 
They are doing a lot of what we're talking about. I mean, that model that I showed you for what we should have as, as kind of a framework for planning in Colorado, much of that is already being done in Fort Collins. So again, I, I said, there's a lot of really good planning that happens in Colorado, but we've got 360 municipalities. We've got 64 counties. And if you've got, you know, some places really doing good things and other places not really doing anything, uh, that, uh, uh, that doesn't help overall. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. It's developer driven a lot of times. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, yeah. yeah, there's a good point. So I know like when I worked in Denver, we had a requirement that a development, uh, once they hurt, hit a certain threshold, they had to set aside 10% for parks and open space of their site didn't relate to population. So, I mean, so if you had a, a 10 acre site that was going to develop, um, you know, maybe 200 housing units on it. Okay. That's one thing, but if it's a 10 acre site that was going to have 2000 housing units on it, uh, then you're creating a, a park deficiency. So, you know, it should be based on, uh, number of units or number of residents rather than just uh, the footprint, the two-dimensional footprint of a development site. Yeah. And some of that could be plazas, which doesn't really Absolutely. do anything. <laughs> doesn't do anything. And yeah, I've been around the block with that one when I worked for Denver. <laughs> and if they're doing an open space plaza, does the public have access to it? You know, uh, not necessarily. So. <laughs> All right, does anyone else have any questions or comments for Rocky? Okay. Well, we really thank you for your time, Rocky. And based on all the information you've shared with us tonight, it's just so very, very interesting. We may have to put you on our permanent speaker list here to come back every year. Happy, happy to do that. So and share the updates because it's all so very interesting. Well, thank yes. you. Th thank you, Rocky. Um, if we have a couple of minutes, um, Kate was going to give a quick update on the four cause eviction. Is that okay? Sure. Absolutely. Thank you, so, Rocky. Rocky. Yep. Thank you're you. welcome to join us or feel free to drop off and carry on. I, I may stick around and listen. Okay. All right. Kate, go ahead. Well, um, <laughs> The update is that this keeps getting laid over in legislation. Legislation, so um, it got laid over in the Senate again today. But it's been a very lively discussion. As uh, was the um, the uh, occupancy limit um, prohibition bill that was heard in the Senate today for second reading. But the uh, our our. We have a bunch of identified problems in Colorado, one of which is that landlords can evict tenants at the end of their lease without a specific reason. Landlords can also use eviction uh, as a tool to raise rent, retaliate, and discriminate against tenants. The Denver metro area has the second highest annual rent inflation nationally. Repeat, second highest nationally of inflation in rents. In January, Denver saw 1,500 eviction filings, the second highest monthly total in years. Um, in 2022, 7,200 um, Colorado households were renters and 1,600 were extremely low income. Um, the reasons of a, a, a landlord under this new bill that is uh, uh, hotly contested, <laughs> reasons a landlord can evict a tenant are non-payment of rent, uh, substantial lease violations, lease violations that the tenant doesn't fix in the time frame required by the bill, uh, criminal activity, and causing a nuisance or disturbance. Um, there's a no fault provision that is very clearly outlined and the no fault eviction can occur when landlord takes the unit off the rental market 
for personal or business reasons. And those reasons include uh, conversion or demolition of the unit, substantial repairs or renovations that make the unit unsafe to live in, safe uh, sale of the single family home, town home or individual condo. A family member uh, moves into the unit uh, and that would include the landlord if the landlord wants to move into the unit. Uh, refusal to sign a new lease agreement with reasonable terms. So if the tenant does not agree to reasonable terms, then that's a no fault a, a cause to ask somebody to leave. Tenant has two plus payments more than 10 days late during the lease term. Um, for cause eviction, this law will address the power dime imbalance between corp uh, corporate landlords and tenants. It will also keep more families in their homes by protecting them from eviction without cause or a landlord's refusal to renew their lease agreement. Evictions are life altering and preventable. We must protect our most vulnerable tenants from unjust evictions to prevent displacement and first time homelessness. Um, for cause eviction legislation will give more Coloradans a greater sense of housing security and a safe and stable place to call home, regardless of their zip code, race, or income level. The uh, the bulk of the proponents against this bill have been uh, that have been testifying and against it in committee have been actually landlords that this would not apply to in large measure. Um, it, it just means it, ha it creates a framework of notice provisions so that people get notice in advance of any of these conditions that cause the landlord to terminate the lease. And then the only time that a, a landlord actually has to take somebody to court for eviction is if they don't surrender the property. I mean, it's really very basic. A lot of the landlords are saying, but we, we you know, may not want to uh, renew the lease. Okay, then you have provisions. You know, if the tenant is a problem, there are provisions that handle your abilities to ask them to, not, to leave either through eviction proceedings or to not renew the lease and um, you just give notice. So anybody have any questions they'd like to ask? We did have a couple of uh, people who um, uh, through our at call our action alerts for the uh, testifying before the committees um, we, I did receive back some questions from the from league members around the state. Um, there were two individuals that had more specific questions, but honestly, most of the mom and pop uh, landlords that were very concerned about this bill, this will not impact the way they do their business currently. So it, it's you know, they were saying that they like their tenants, they keep the rents low, they want to keep them, they want to keep the the uh, units occupied and not vacant and so forth and so on. So uh, nothing in this bill would prevent them from do operating the way that they were portraying that they operate now. Go ahead. Hey, do we know what percentage of the housing in the Denver metro area is corporate owned? I don't have those figures, in, in it, but I do know it's growing exponentially. And one of the big issues that the mom and pop landlords were talking about is that people are getting out of the business in the small arena, the small unit owners, um, and that the corporations are buying up their properties and, and they have the deep pockets, they have the cash, they have the leverage, and it is an issue. Um, and there has been quite a bit of concern about that, but this is one of the measures that will help um, tenants protect against the corporate management and ownership from taking advantage of um, our current non-existent um, 
uh, tenant rights, basically. Have they mentioned, I don't know if it's Pittsburgh, um, I, I think because Pittsburgh has been reimagined, they had corporate ownership at somewhere near 60 to 75 percent. Wow. And their change of how to deal with that because the gentrification was just awful. Um, I don't know whether the laws are similar. It'd be an interesting thing to compare. I do know that uh, New Jersey has implemented similar laws, and I know California has had essentially the same structure for tenants' rights um, for a long time, and New Jersey has had it for a long time as well. And, you know, developers don't seem to want to stop building or having a landlord situation and whatnot. Um, I do know also that there's a provision in our statutes that allow for some of these larger uh, apartment buildings to eventually be converted to condos if the uh, if the developer or the owner chooses to do so, you know, chooses to allow that to happen. It can be done, but it it's a model. The rental market is just a model for profit, just huge model for profit. Right. And the other thing Denver is trying to handle is licensing rental properties. Has the state talked about that at all to make sure that the basics are there? Not that I'm aware of. Um, I know they're looking at doing that for short-term rentals specifically. Uh, mm -hmm. Certainly in Lakewood, they're doing that. And some of the resort, uh, rural resort communities, they're looking at doing that. But as far as I know, uh, they are not looking at licensing whatsoever. Okay, thank you. Um, I was just curious if you happen to know if they were able to get more votes before poor cause goes for the final vote on the Senate floor. Um, they they did pass it. Uh, I, they adopted the bill. Um, I didn't see the vote count at the time. <laughs> I had, a, I had to take a, a bio break right when they took the vote after hours of sitting there listening to a lot of kvetching. So it, it well, was- Well, I mean, like, is it going up tomorrow, maybe? Uh, it's it's on third reading tomorrow, yes. So yeah, it was just, last I'd heard, they still needed two more votes, so I was- It, had, it was adopted today, so- Oh, okay. You know, it, it did go through, so it's up for third reading, so- Whoever those people were have been convinced, I believe. But the third reading is when the actual vote is. And, right. and, and I think it's actually put off till the 21st. So I think they're probably still vote hunting. Yeah, that could be. Thanks, Kathy. Um, there were a lot of amendments introduced today that were really um, pretty awful. And they mostly failed. There was one positive amendment that addressed uh, the opposition's concerns um, that they were offended by the word, uh, uh, some language in the in the legislative declaration. And so um, Senator Gonzalez um, amended out the legislative declaration. Thank you, Kate. Any other questions or comments for Kate? All right, Kathy, do you have anything more to add tonight? Just uh, thank you everyone for coming. Do we have a plan for next month? Do you want to advertise? Um, boy, Kathy, I don't write. I, I think I have one in the back of my mind, but I'm not ready to advertise it yet until I get it. Put together. Um, I will advertise, I think, um, hopefully all of you got notice of um, the Larimer County Affordable Housing Team is putting on a panel April 11th uh, that we're very excited about on skyrocketing housing prices and a little digging into why that is the case. So you may want to consider jumping onto Zoom for that one. And I want to put a plug in for Rocky's book. I haven't read it yet, Rocky, but I, I did buy it. 
Oh, well, tell us about that, Rocky. Yeah, so uh, people who know me know I, I'm 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 kind of a modest person, but I have to say the book is selling like hotcakes, according to our publisher. So it's called the Comprehensive Plan for the 21st Century, and it really is the seminal book for how we need to be doing our urban planning uh, today and uh, into the future. So uh, yeah, so. Um, uh yeah I'll, I'll send you in, information on it and Do. Uh, great yeah so uh yeah it's available on amazon i'll give you the publishers uh uh website so you might want to buy it from them instead of amazon if, if that's kind of your preference so so thanks very good congratulations that's great all right well on that note i think we can say good night just stay tuned for information on our Mar or our April meeting. Um, we definitely will be meeting on the third Monday. So we'll get that info out to you as soon as we can. So thank you again for your time this evening and we'll see you next month. Thanks again, Rocky. Thank you, Rocky. Yeah.